All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Kabbalah Cafe. This is our, thank you, this is our um, weekly power mystical jolt. Those words have not been put in proximity probably ever because it didn't really make sense in a sentence. Nonetheless, we get together Sunday mornings to inspire and re-inspire ourselves and get the week started on a great foot. So it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you all this morning to a Kabbalistic conversation. Now, the context so last week, we spoke about espionage. And the big idea that we spoke about is if you want to be a good spy, the French have a big history with spying. Yes. Right? Russians too. Russians too. Israelis too. <laughs> by the way, I'm Israeli, by the way. I was born in Israel. Yeah. I may or may not be a spy. I cannot confirm, nor than I. Just saying. You have a satellite dish in your home? Satellite dish. Yeah, I lived across the street from no. an Israeli once, and three in the morning, the roof would open up, the satellite. <laughs> would up. Is that real? Are you serious? You can... No, okay. Well, we used to All right, well, then that would, that would be very cool if that would... That. Got it. That would be very cool if that was a thing. All right, so here's the deal. Last week, we spoke about espionage, and we said that to be a good spy, here's what you need to do. You need to be able to infiltrate, to go in and make yourself very comfortable or make people comfortable with you. You have to be very close. And at the same time, you can't forget who you are, which is a spy. Because if you get too close and you get too, you know, comfortable and you be, you develop too many close friendships, then you wouldn't want to betray them. So it's super, it's super devious. You have to be close so that they think that, they're, that you're their friend, but not close enough where you're actually caring about stealing their secrets. <laughs> That's if you want to be a good spy. Sounds, again, super devious, but that's the deal. And we said, the big idea last week was that we are all spies. Spiritually, we are spies. God sends our soul down into this world on a spy mission. What's the spy mission? Um, not search and destroy, but seek and collect. You see, there's divine sparks. There's spiritual energy. There is incredible spiritual potential everywhere around us. And our mission is to go into the world to allegedly or supposedly engage in physical activities just like everyone else, but do it for a higher purpose. So for example, when we eat our lavish, and now I have the right terminology, when we eat our lavish continental breakfast, <laughs> right? Today is not a hot breakfast, but a continental breakfast. By the way, it includes a free hotel stay. You guys didn't know that, right? Hampton okay. Inn. Huh? Hampton Inn? No, um, this is Hotel California. <laughs> But you can't get out. Yeah. It's like a whole thing, <laughs> right? Exactly. Or we'll leave the light on for you, just to mix uh, to mix ads. So, so um, when you eat, for example, and this is a big the reason why I'm using I used it last week. I use it this week again quickly is because Kabbalah speaks a lot about this example of eating because it's an activity that we all do multiple times a day. So when we eat, we could eat. It looks on the surface like like everyone else is eating. And yet we say a bracha beforehand, we say a, a blessing before, a blessing after. We think about why we're eating. We meditate on the fact, you know, even a short meditation on the fact that this is food that's coming from Hashem ultimately, and that it's for a purpose for uh, to give us, to grant us energy with which to fulfill our purpose in life. And, by, uh, and by doing so, we actually elevate the experience to a higher level. This is what it means to be a spy. What it means is that you go in to a place, you make yourself familiar with that place, but really you have an agenda and your agenda is to elevate the sparks of light that are inside that food. I explained last week that that's the secret of the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob taking the blessings from his younger brother, from his older brother, sorry, where he goes in, he dresses like his brother and chaps, Yiddish, you know what chap means? Mm -hmm. Take, right? Mm -hmm. He takes the blessings. Um, and, 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 Spiritually, that's what we do as well. Every time we eat and, and, and engage in other physical endeavors, we go in dressed in the garbs of Esau. We dress up like Esau. We dress up like everyone else in the world. But inside, in truth, we are Yaakov, we're Jacob, and we're engaging in this for a higher purpose. So we go to work like everyone else. But we have in mind tzedakah. We have in mind charity. We have in mind using the money for Shabbat, for holidays, for, for Simchot, whatever it is. We, we, we utilize the resources for a higher purpose. Or 
we we eat or we engage in any other um, activity and, and, the, and the, the deeper agenda, the deeper intention is for something higher. So this is, in general, what we spoke about last week about espionage. So this week, we're going to continue the narrative. And, and just so, so everyone's on the same page here, we're going to focus and really jump into our text this week. We're going to focus on two espionage stories in biblical literature, two spy stories, the story of the spies sent by Moses, by Moshe, and the story of the spies sent by Joshua, Yehoshua. Now, but before we get there, I need to, to preface this um, with another insight. So the Torah tells us, and this was not yesterday's Torah portion, but the week before, Shlach, the Torah tells us about the spies, the Meraglim, the spies that Moses sent. So the Torah portion opens, Shlach Lecha, Anashim, send for yourself men. Send these individuals. So God tells Moses, send lecha, shlach lecha. Send for your... So the commentaries wonder, what's the lecha? You say, it's weird in Hebrew. You say, shlach anashim, send men. What's shlach lecha anashim, send to you or for you or by you men? So Rashi comments right away. Rashi, of course, is our go-to standard um, commentary. Right, he gives you pshat. He writes in his introduction, by the way, Rashi, Rabbi Shlomi Yitzchaki, he lived about 800, 900 years ago um, from France. He was a winemaker. Do you guys know that Rashi was a winemaker? Rashi made wine. You can buy it in a You can even buy Rashi wine today. Although, <laughs> by the way, I have a case of, it's so funny that you oh. said that. I have a case of Rashi wine that's old. And I, I use the last name for Havdalah. You ever you ever use like old wine and you're doing like Havdalah, you're holding and it's like dripping a little bit because you know, like we overflow the cup, whatever, we go all over, all in. And then it's dripping. And then I see it on the plate and it's like a little bit brown. You ever see that where your wine is not red anymore? It's like in the plate is red. I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh, that's going to be some vinegar. I'm like, I'm like gearing up for that one. Uh, anyway, it was fine. I'm still here. Um <laughs> <laughs> a little wiser a little. <laughs> about that case that I found in my garage. Manashevitz always stays. Oh, it's always. <laughs> it does. It just is as it is. Rashi gets that. Anyways, but, but Rashi, the original, the OG Rashi, the original Rashi, he made wine. Um, he was a, he had a winery. He, he was a. Ra no, not Rashi. Vintner. Rambam. I, oh, I was going to ask what that's. Vit He's a Vintner. Vintner? That's what a winemaker is. Vintner. Sounds like a Jewish last name. Nice. Solomon what? Yarchi. Solomon Yarchi. Right. Yarach means moon. Oh, interesting. Right, I think you showed me in that, uh, the Bible that you have. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Rashi himself. So Rashi, oh, so back to Rashi. So Rashi comments, why shlach lecha anashim? Why does God tell Moshe to send for yourself, men? Rashi says, you know what it means? Hashem, God was telling Moses, Hashem was telling Moshe, ain't I'm not going to tell you what to do. You do it on your own. Now, that would be a huge red flag. Because imagine if for years, somebody's telling you, do this, do that. And when you consult, they answer you, do this, do that. Somebody that you trust. And then one day you ask them a question. They say, you know what? I'm going to stay out of this one. I'm not, I'm not going to answer. That would be like the ultimate red flag. So question number one is, on this narrative is, number one, why doesn't God give Moshe a clear answer? Why doesn't Moshe, why doesn't Moses flag that as something strange and therefore something to avoid? Um, and question number three, which is the obvious question in the whole narrative, is the Torah describes these, well, there are 12 men chosen for this mission, one for each from each tribe, and the Torah describes them as men of renown, or men of repute, men of uh, stature. So the question that we're going to ask is, um, how could these individuals that were men of stature ultimately go, fall to such a low place where they slandered the land of Israel. They said, oh, it's not, we can't go in. God can't help us. Uh, um, uh, God, even God won't be able to help us conquer this land. How could they have fallen so low? So I want to share a quick insight. There are many different angles on this. Hey, Matt, welcome. There are many insights on this. Um, what I want to do is share um, one angle that I think is going to be helpful um, as we approach this narrative. And then that will segue us into the Kabbalistic understanding 
of this entire story and the contrast between the story of Moses' spies and Joshua's spies. So here's the angle. I wrote about this in the email. If you saw the email on Friday, I wrote about this in the email. So when it comes to, um, uh, I don't know, maturity or <laughs> getting older, but not like when you're a kid. So when you're a kid, your decisions are made for you, right? That's the way it is. Your decisions are made for you. As you get older, you make more decisions on your own. And it's an interesting process as a, you know, as a parent, it's an interesting process by which you kind of pull back and let your kids step into their own space. And it almost requires an intentionality in that part. I mean, I think a lot of it happens naturally, but it also requires an intentionality to intentionally create space to allow your children to be who they are and to make their own choices. And they might, they might not always align with, with what we would want or what we hope for them, but it's, it's that process of, of giving space to allow them to stand up on their own two feet. You know the book, The Giving Tree? So I've taught classes on The Giving Tree before. Shel Silverstein. Yeah. And it's a, um, it's a book that contains a profound lesson about parenting, mm -hmm. amongst other things. And that is, if you keep on giving and giving and giving, your child will not grow up. They won't. The first time, I wish we had the book here. Anyway, the first time the boy goes to the tree. I mean, they're in love, the boy and the tree. Hey, honey. Boy, yeah. The boy loves the tree and the boy can't get it. The boy just loves hanging around the tree. The tree is, is like means so much to the boy. At some point, the boy, oh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> Ellen's got it. There you go, they're giving tree. So at some point, the boy says to the tree, um, I, need, I need money. I need money for whatever it is. What does the tree say? Take my apples and sell them. And then the boy needs more money. Just take my trunk or take my branches. So, oh, I need a boat. Take my branches, make a boat. You know what the tree should have said to the boy the first time the boy said, I need money? Go and earn it. Get a job. Get a Go job. Go and earn it. Now that sounds, is that cruel? No, it's, it's giving space for the child. It's not doing it for the kid. The giving tree works against it so that when the last page of the book, when the boy is now an old man and he's alone, and sad and sitting on a stump on the stump of the tree that he cut down that he loved the tree is happy and the tree says to the boy the tree says like come boy don't feel don't feel so sad the 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 the, the person is still a boy in the tree's eyes because the tree never allowed the boy to grow space to grow and that's a, it's a cautionary, I mean, you could read the story many different ways, but it's a, one way to read it as I'm reading it is a cautionary tale of not giving that space to your kids or really to anyone in your orbit because giving space is a key to growth. It's a key to stepping into your own selfhood. The key to selfhood is autonomy and having space. And one of the greatest gifts, or if not the greatest gift, I'm only speaking tentatively because you know I'm sure there's other great gifts, but one of the greatest gifts that, that, that adults can give children, parents can give children, is the gift of selfhood for them to recognize their own self and to step into their own space. And in a sense, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sam, I'll repeat what you said so that everybody on online can hear it as well. Sam is saying that there's a nice, a nice word, a nice idea that it's not about raising children, it's about raising adults, raising human beings to be self-standing, to be, to be a mensch on two feet. And that requires, again, a lot of that happens, I guess, organically, one, to one extent or another, but there's also an intentionality, but intentionally giving space. And not doing it for your kid or not telling them what to do in all scenarios, but allowing them, obviously you give the guidance and you give the, you give the framework, but it's about allow, giving them the space that they can really kind of assume their own, their own selfhood and not feel like they had to grab it away from you, which creates resentment. But if they had to snatch it from you because you never gave it, so then that's, that creates its own thing. So according to one angle on the story of the spies that Moshe sends, this is what was going on. Basically, the Jewish people were in their adolescence as a people. 
they had weathered, I don't know what the right way to say this, they had survived Egypt, um, experienced the exodus, the putting of the sea, the giving of the Torah. They had experienced also a major setback with the sin of the golden calf, but also the rebound with building the Mishkan, building the tabernacle. And every step of the way, there was always divine input about what to do and where to go. And God had told them that they were to go into the land of Israel. But now at this point, something was changing. When God says, sorry, when Moses says to God, hey, should we send in spies to check out the land before we go in? And God says, it's up to you. What was really happening? Hashem was telling Moshe, at this point, you need to make the call. I'm not going to tell you where to go. It's because this is not an on. Because think about our lives. When was the last time you heard God tell you exactly what to do? I mean, we pray for it and we hope that we're pointed in the right direction, and that our choices are aligned with our purpose. That's what we pray and hope for. But we don't have we don't have a divine divine messages every morning telling us exactly what our itinerary is. We don't have that. I mean, maybe we would want that, but we don't have that. That. Yeah, yeah, but the point, but I'm saying the point is that this transition was happening at this point in Jewish history, where for the first little while, everything was being kind of handed on a silver platter. Do this, say that, go here, don't go here. Everything was dictated from above. But that's not how that's not that's not forever. At a certain point in time, the child, in this case, our people, right? The Jewish people, the children of Israel, the child has to become. An adult, and part of adulting, right, is making your own decision. So if God says to Moses, all right, now you're going to make the call. And you know what? It may blow up in your face. But guess what? <laughs> Haven't we all made decisions that have blown up in our face? On every level, whether it's interpersonal, whether it's business, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, spiritual. We've all made bad decisions. Bad decisions. We all made decisions that have not worked out, and we learn from them. This was a learning experience. It, what, it's, it's, this is the important point. Life is not about getting it right always. Life is about learning and standing up on our own two feet. If it was about getting it right, God would have never stopped dictating exactly what we should be doing. But it's about learning and growing on our own. It, 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 it evokes you know, the experience of teaching a child how to walk. How do you teach a child how to walk? So the child is, you know, at a certain point, they're, you know, the first thing is they pull themselves up and they fall down. Then they pull themselves up and they may be like holding on to things as they, I think they call it cruising. Maybe they're cruising around the living room and hopefully you've made it like child proof, not sharp edges, right? Um, Moses would have known that if going to up in his face, he wouldn't have done it. Or maybe he would have, I don't know. I, maybe he would have said. There's a French philosopher that says, you know, you learn from other people's experience, not your own experience. Right? So is there anything that was there that he should have learned from the time he went up? From Same from the previous time yeah. about, about a warning. It seems like, I, we'll give him the benefit of that. It seems like he didn't realize or he didn't necessarily perceive that it was going to blow up so, so spectacularly. But the idea that, you know, the question that I asked is, well, if God's not telling him what to do, isn't that a red flag? I mean, kind of yes and no. It is a red flag in the sense that up until then, God was telling him exactly what to do. But on the other hand, at this point, this was a this was kind of a transition point. And by the way, this is also historically transitional because think about it. In the desert, what did they eat? Bread from heaven, right? Well, matzo for a little bit, then it ran out. But then they had bread, and then they started complaining. Then they had bread from heaven. And what about when they would transition into Israel? Guess what? They would have to be farmers. You want to eat? Go to work. There's no bread delivered to your doorstep. There's no Instacart. Well, I mean, there is now, <laughs> but not then, <laughs> right? There was no, well, we don't know. No, but there was no divine, it's a divine Instacart gratis, right? Free divine Instacart, free prime membership, whatever that is. That was for 40 years or whatever the, their time in the desert. But going into Israel, things were going to change. Now you have to be a mensch. Now you have to be an adult. You got to, if you want to eat, you got to, you got to make it happen. God's not going to hand out everything like that. Why? Not that he couldn't, but at some point God wants us to grow. Oh, so getting back to a child. So the child starts walking, uh, starts holding on and, and kind of cruising around the, around the house. But you want to teach a child to actually walk without holding on. So you position yourself. So the kids somewhere over there, right? You take a few steps back and you say, 
come to me, or that's that would be weird to say that, but like uh, whatever you would say to your kid, to tati. come to Tati. Hey, give Tati a hug or whatever it is. So the child takes a tentative step, falls, gets back up, you know, over the span of a few days or a few weeks, whatever it is, and eventually takes the first step, takes the first few steps. And then inevitably, what does the parent do? The parent, as the child gets closer, moves, moves back. As the child is about to get to you, you take a step back. And then they get to you, get, get close again, you take another step back. And you can you can imagine the what the child is thinking. It's like, hold on, <laughs> try, I'm trying to give you a hug. And you keep on moving backwards. And there's a very important message here that the child either gets or doesn't get, but that's being conveyed either way. And that is, it's not about the hug. It's about, it's not about the destination. It's about learning how to walk. God, and this is, I think, a very important point. It's not always about the destination, but it's learning how to walk on our own two feet. So will they get to Israel? Yeah. Right away in 40 years, God has plenty of time. But it's about learning how to walk. And learning how to walk means that you make decisions and you may fall, but you make your own decisions because otherwise you're not walking. You're being handheld. And that's great for security and safety and for assurance that you'll get there. But that's not living. That's not really, really living means that you're making choices and you're taking risks and you're failing often. And you pick yourself back up and you keep on going. And it seems sometimes that the destination or the goal keeps on moving on you. But that's all part of the plan. It's like, can we ever reach God? Do we ever finally come to a place where like, I have finally arrived at a connection relationship with God and I'm set. Never will happen. God is infinite. The goalposts are always moving. And it can seem frustrating because today I felt that I was getting closer to God and then tomorrow I feel not so close with God. And what's happening? Things are moving. And the point is, it's not about getting there. It's about, it's about the journey. It's about learning how to walk on our own two feet. God was teaching Moshe how to walk. God says to Moshe, you have a very good question. Should you send spies? Should you not send spies? Moshe, God says, Moses, you make that call. That's also why the spies failed in their mission. Because they knew that at the point when they cross into Israel, it's going to be the, the, the miracles, the miraculous intervention is going to end. That it's now going to be, uh, they're going to be on their own two feet. And they're off, yes. And who and 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 why would they have wanted to do that? Yes, it's part of how they who wouldn't want to still live by divine gift and divine protection in the desert. It was amazing, clouds of glory protecting them. But well, of mir- did they know that was going to disappear? They knew, they knew. Now, they he's pictured the conversation between Moshe and Hashem. Some, something more like, hey, Hashem, should I send in spies? And Hashem says, what are you kidding? After <laughs> all that I've done, I made you promise. You think I'm going to back off on the promise? If it makes you happy, send the spies. Right. But Hashem was saying, you don't need to. Right. But at the end of the day, he gave the, 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 the choice to Moshe. And Moshe thought it would be better for whatever reason. But, but pursuant to what you said, which is very important, what were... Th- what did the spies think? Did the spies not believe that God could take them successfully into the land of Israel? Of course he did. Of course they did. Sorry, the spies did. But the spies also knew that at that point when they go into Israel, it's going to be less about divine intervention and more about their own effort. And if it's about their own effort, well, then number one, how much do they trust themselves in each other? Number two, do they really want that? Do they want to be adults? Or maybe they just want to remain they were, yeah, they had a slave mindset, right? That was right. That, and that's the psychology as my, now to be responsible for themselves. And that's a major transition because, and that's a, thank you, Sam, for saying that, because that's a very important point, because even as a slave, there's a dependency. So now you're free, but you're, now you're dependent on God. And then crossing over the border into Israel, that would transition from dependency to independence. And that's a very scary thing. Now you're in charge of your own destiny. You are calling the shots, not only about making decisions, but you're now responsible for yourself. That's a, that's a, big, that's a big deal. Again, so just thinking about the, the divine favors that they had in, in the desert, in the wilderness. They had food, they had water, they had clothing, they had shelter. Everything was provided for them. 
crossing into Israel, suddenly now they're going to have to fight their own battles. They're going to, of course, with God's help, but, but it's on them now. Now they're the ones charting their own destiny, making choices. It's a little vulnerable. It's a little scary. So they wanted to kind of remain in that, in that space. It's kind of like what Pirkei Avot says. Pirkei Avot is, I'm sure I don't have to mention it, is incredible. Ethics of our fathers. Pirkei Avot, it says, Baal karchach atachai. Against your will, you are born. The soul doesn't want to come into this world. You know why? Because the soul is spiritually comfortable. And anytime you move from a place of comfort into a place of, sorry, let me try this again. Anytime you move from a place of dependency to a place of independence, when I say independence, a place where now you're responsible, it's a little scary. That's why the child for the first time, think about the child in utero, even the, the biological piece of it, right? So the, 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 the fetus, so the fetus is not eating on its own. It's not drinking on its own. It's not, right? It's food, clothing, and shelter. Clothing, whatever. No clothing. But food and shelter, all of that is provided for. Sure. Not clothing. Yeah. All right. That works. Not a clip, huh? Yeah, it's got something. It's got something. So all of that is provided for. And then it's born. The child is born. And now it's on its own. Obviously, to a certain extent, it's now on its own. But, but of course, it's not. But there is that, there is that moment of, of of transition between wholly taken solely taken care of and and not and that is um and that and that's a that's a that's a big step that was a step that the spies were afraid of and ultimately as the people heard the news of the spies and they and they cried and they they said we don't want to go that that was a um, an expression of their own fears now that's all the way that that, that all of this is how classic commentaries explain as well as some mystical commentaries explain the story of the spies but what we're going to do today jumping into our text is look at this from a very mystical perspective and, and a very personal perspective and again contrast the story of the spies of moses with the story of the spies of joshua that's going to be the big idea that we're going to be presenting so please take and pass thank you please take and pass plenty of copies to go around and a little extra. I'm going to pull it up here on our screen as well. Yeah, that's all you need. You're good. You are good. <laughs> all right, I'm going to pull this up for our Zoom crew. And let's get this party started. Now, just a little bit of context. This was a discourse that was um, uh, a Hasidic discourse, a mystical text authored, well, originally uh, spoken by the Rebbe in the year 1976. Chaf Ches Sivan, the 28th day of Sivan, 1976. The 28th of Sivan is a very special day on the Chabad Hasidic calendar. It's the day that the Rebbe and his wife uh, came to America for the first time in the 1940s. And uh, that, of course, marked a... Um, you know, uh, the, the Rebbe and the Rebbitson being saved from Nazi Germany and, and, and escaping, etc., arriving on the shores of America, that was a big deal. So let's jump in now to this discourse that talks about spies. Um, and the focus is on the Haftorah, which is um, from the book of uh, Joshua, which speaks about the, it's, it's the Haftorah of Pasha Shlach, the Torah portion that speaks of the spies that Moses sent, the Haftorah, the part of the of the prophets that we read after the Torah reading is about Joshua spies. And the opening line is the quote, the opening line from the half Torah. And Joshua sent two men spies. So this is the story of Joshua. Contrast to Mo by in contrast to Moses, who sent 12 spies, Joshua sent two spies. And by all accounts, that mission was successful. So here we go. Let's let's read inside. In Lakute Torah. Now, the Kutit Torah is a, is a mystical work penned by the first of the Chabad Rebbe's. In the Mimer, by this title, the difference between the spies sent by Joshua and those spent by Moses is explained. So in that text, uh, the, 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 the contrast between Joshua's spies and Moses' spies, that contrast is elucidated. And here we're going to develop that right here, right now. Regarding those spies sent by Moses, it is written, God said to Moses, send for you or send for yourself. 
and as the sages interpret the meaning of for you, send spies according to your judgment. I am not commanding you to send them. And that's, of course, what I've been talking about thus far. The sending of the spies by Joshua, however, was not by his judgment, but by divine decree. So difference number one between the spies sent by Moses and the spies sent by Joshua is that Moses' spies were up to Moses. God says to Moses, as we said, Moshe said God says to Moshe, you, you choose, you decide, I am not commanding you either way. However, the spies sent by Joshua, by Yoshua, were by divine decree. That's difference number one. Difference number two, another difference. The spies sent by Joshua were sent only to Jericho, the lock of the land, the lock of the land of Israel, through which they scouted the entire land. The spies sent by Moses, on the other hand, traverse the entire land to its length and to its breadth. So one difference is vis-a-vis -vis the divine influence. God is not influencing the spies sent, or God is not mandating the spies that Moses sends. God is leaving that up to the volition, to the choice, to the choice of Moses. Whereas by Joshua, God is dictating that. That's difference number one. Difference number two is that the spy is where they went. Where did the spies go? The spies sent by Joshua went only to the city of Yericho, Jericho, whereas the spies sent by Moses traversed the entire land, its length and its breadth, and it took them 40 days. What's interesting, if you recall the story of Joshua's spies, um, if you're familiar with that story, so he sends these two spies, they go to Jericho, and they go to a woman's house, and the word leaks out to the king, to the government, that is that Jewish spies are in Jericho and they're looking and they come to this woman's house and they say, have you seen these men? She quickly hides them on the roof. Apparently that was a thing. And apparently they didn't check the roof. So they, check, they, they, go, they come to her house. Have you seen these men? She said, yes, they were here. But then they went, but then they ran that way. So she sends them she sends the, uh, the, the, government. the government agents agents after them, she, misdirection. They, meanwhile, when, when the coast is clear, this is a classic, you know, whatever story. So when the coast is clear, she tells them to come down from the roof. They come down from the roof. And, uh, and they're so grateful for saving their lives uh, that they tell her, that when we ult when our people when the Jewish people ultimately come into Israel and and kind of you know uh, 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 wage battle wage the war make sure to put a sign by your door by your window that huh Save to spare yeah to spare you and your family members right you get a free pass she you asked, she, asked. she asked for that okay yeah, yeah so she asked for that and they said yes they consented thanks for the clarification and they and they uh, they consented to that and indeed that's what happened. So those were the and 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 the everything went went okay. The spies went in. Oh, and they also Why learned. She saved them to begin with, though they were the enemy. Oh, so she says this that that we heard the stories of your people, and we know that your God is with you. And ever since the Exodus and the miracles, we've all been trembling. We've all been afraid of you guys. So once the spies heard this, they go back to Joshua and they're like. We're afraid of them. <laughs> They're afraid of us. <laughs> They're more afraid of us than we are of them. I always tell my kids when they see a bug, and they get scared. I'm like, think about size for a second. You're you're much. You're afraid of the bug. The bug is way more afraid of you. I mean, conception. I don't know if they actually are. I'm not. I'm not in the bug set, but <laughs> conception. So so um, Josh, Needless to say, Joshua's mission works out swimmingly, swimmingly, perfectly. It's it's a success. Moses' mission blew up and and ended in four years of wandering. Um, and the difference between them, in addition to the outcome, is when God. Uh, so Moses' mission came from his own volition, his own choice, whereas Joshua's mission was divinely um, uh, commanded. The second difference is the spies sent by Joshua only went to that one city, Jericho. Then they came back and they reported back, "We got this." Whereas Moses' spies, they went all around the land. One other interesting twist of fate. There were 12 spies that Moses sent. 10 of the 12 came back with a very uh, negative report about the land. Two of the 12 spies remained 
firm, steadfast in their faith in God. Who were they? Caleb and Joshua. The same Joshua that sent two spies. That's the twist. I don't know if you call it ironic. You have to ask Alanis Morissette if that's ironic or not. But anyway, the, the iron, huh? Right. Well, so here's the thing. You would think after being the minority of, of the 12 spies that, that then, you know, derailed the, the Jewish entry into the land of Israel for another 39, 40 years, you would think that maybe Joshua would be a little gun shy in sending two more spies because Ayve, he knows what that could have gone like. And yet he does it and it's successful. So really what this discourse is going to get to is what constitutes the difference between the failure of Moses and the success of Joshua? We have a little clue, 12 spies, two spies, God's command, not God's command, Jericho, the whole land. But what really, what really was the difference between the failure of Moses' spies and the success of Joshua's spies? And again, just to, re, just to emphasize this, the way that we're going to look, this, look at this in our text is a very novel way. It's very personal, and it almost pulls the story out of its in, in original context and into our own spirituality and psychology. It's very fascinating. So let's jump into to, to chapter two. And he says, the core of the matter is this. This is the core idea. And just to give you a, a quick, uh, a, a quick, a quick, some quick framing here. You know, there's different, different levels that you can study Torah at. There's pardes, pshat, remes, drush, and sod. There's the simple meaning, Rashi, right? He'll give you the simple understanding. You have Remez, which is like the hints and the allegories in Torah. You have Drush, the Medrash, Medrashic exposition. And then you have Sod. Sod is the Kabbalah. Sod is the mystical side of it. We're now jumping to a mystical reading of the story. The core of this matter is the commandment, back inside chapter two, the commandment to conquer the land in the spiritual sense is like all commandments of the Torah, an eternal concept, for every generation. I need to explain what that means. What he's about to tell us is that this mission of going into and conquering Israel is not a once upon a time, 3,300 years ago endeavor. This is a constant ongoing battle. In other words, every single day of our lives, we are tasked with, so to speak, conquering the land of Israel. What does that mean? Let's read it inside. He translates it for us. Conquering the land in a spiritual sense means that every Jew must conquer all the faculties and elements of his body and animal soul. The land of, let's go to the next page, the land of Canaan and render them vessels for godliness, thereby transforming them into the land of Israel. So let me explain that for a quick moment. What was happening? The land of Israel had a different name at that point in time. It was called the land of Canaan or the land of Canaan. The Hebrew is Canaan, the English is Canaan. And what were they meant to do? They were meant to conquer the land, i.e. transform it from Canaan to Israel. Yeah. The Canaanites. So where did they come from originally? Um, he, Can, yeah, Canaan was a name. One of the biblical, uh, he's, his genealogy, there was a guy named Canaan. His genealogy is, is, is traced in the book of Genesis. And he becomes the... He's the a curse, right? Yeah. 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 yeah he's, Canaan is one of the descendants of, um, of Noah. Where are they today? The Canaanites? Yeah. Because aren't they the rightful owners of the state of Israel? That can be argued. The, well, it's complicated. The Muslims that we were there first. Right. No, so it's a little bit, it's a little, it's interesting. Rashi in the first Rashi on the Torah, he addresses this. He says that that's why the Torah opens up with God created the world. Why do we need to know that little detail? Because God, God gave it to them for a little while. God gave it to us. So God decides ultimately it's not because we were there first. It's because of the divine providence that we have in, in the Torah. Now, here's, here's the important thing to remember. The mission then was about transforming the land from an unholy. I mean, for, let's just speak very practically. The land was steeped in paganism and idolatry. 
And the goal was to bring it into a state of monotheism, of Judaism, right? To make it a Jewish land means to transform it from a pagan space to a Jewish space, from Canaan to Israel. And what he's saying here is, this is indeed the mission of each and every single one of us, every single day. Our task internally, this is not about conquering anything else outside of ourselves. This is about working on ourselves. It's about taking the parts of our personality, the parts of our character that are not aligned with God and making them more aligned with God. That's really what it's about. So, for example, the heart. Where is the heart at? Where is our faculty? You know, we have uh, 10 powers of the soul. Where is our faculty of love? Where is that? What do we love? What do we get excited about? Good, positive things, holy things, or negative things? Yeah. What's our, Where's our love at? Where's our fear at? What are, what are we compassionate about? What are we, what are we ambitious about? Are they higher things or lower things? So the idea of conquering the land is, tra is about transforming, and just to read what he says inside, all the faculties and elements of his body and animal soul and transform them into a holy space, the land of Israel. And of course, that doesn't happen in one moment, and that's a lifetime of work. We're constantly working on ourselves to make ourselves more of a mensch. You know, I've been asked, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me the question, why in the Torah, why in Genesis does it say, does God say in the beginning, uh, let us make man? Who's the us? Na'ase adam betsalmenu kidmusenu. Who's the us? Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Who's the plural? Who's us? Who's God speaking to? So the commentaries say, some commentaries say God is speaking to the angels. Some say God is speaking to heaven and earth. Let us make man heaven and earth. But my favorite interpretation says, you know who the us is? So God, who's the other party? Us. Let us make man is let us make a mensch. To be a mensch, God's going to do some of it. But guess who else has to do that? You and I. You want to be a mensch? God's not going to do that for you. You want to be a mensch? You got to do that. Let us make man. God says, I need your partnership to make you a mensch. I mean, let's be frank here. God could make us a mensch. But then we would be angels, and that would be, that's, he already, met, he already made that. He already has a realm of existence where he created perfect, holy, healthy, you know, spiritual beings. God already has that. It's called heaven, and those are called angels. But God kept on pushing the envelope to create a space, as I said before, with free choice, with autonomy, to give space to the other, which is us, to stand up on our own two feet. And God says, Nase Adam, let us you and I, let us make a man. I'm going to start you off, make you imperfect, and now your job is to work on yourself. And this constitutes the work of life. I mentioned this last week, I believe, where we face challenges throughout life. I, yeah, I mentioned this in the context of, of sparks that we that our soul is destined to uh, to reclaim. Uh, and that if we don't get it right the first time, we have to, you know, we have more opportunities. This is the truth in life. The truth is that we can't escape our own internal character and really spiritual mission. And we may try to run away from that, but, but we, the, the work, the internal work at some point will need to get done. So if we face, if we find ourselves facing similar challenges again and again and again, it means that there's something internally that we have to, that we have to work on. One of my favorite biblical stories that kind of highlights this example is the story of Jacob and Esau. So what happens the night before their fateful encounter? What happens before Jacob meets Esau after 20 years of being separated. So he gets into a fight with, with Esau's angel. Remember that fight? All night, he's wrestling with the angel, Jacob wrestling with the angel. And before, as dawn breaks, what does the angel do? He hits him in the leg, right? He hits him in the leg and causes him to have a limp. And then he moves on his way. I actually mentioned this at a sermon that I gave in the, in the synagogue on that when we read this Torah portion a few months ago. And I asked the question, why did, why did the angel hit him in the leg? Why not in the arm? After all, if they're wrestling, why not uh, the arm would be very effective in, in, in not allowing uh, Jacob to be successful. So why does he hit him in the leg? And the answer that I, that I shared, which is a classic answer that's given, a beautiful answer, is that Jacob had, um, Jacob had, ex ha had expressed quite often the propensity to flee and to run away from conflict. Right when he got into a fight with his brother twenty years prior, he ran away from home. When he when things weren't working out with his uncle, he ran away. 
So he was a guy that was more about like he, he was a guy who who demonstrated this 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 flight tendency when things got a little sticky. Jacob was off and running. And so the angel wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to run away anymore, that he was going to finally meet his brother and deal with it. So he hits him in the leg. Now you can't run. If you're limping, you can't run. Now what? Now you're going to have to deal with your brother. And he deals with his brother. And you know what? It all works out. And the message, the beautiful message is sometimes we run away from the stuff that we need to work on because we're so afraid about how that's going to go. So we run away from it. And that's really running away from our destiny and really our mission, which you can't really run away from that because that's at the end of the day, it's going to keep on pulling you back in. So might as well deal with it and work on it. And so what he's saying here is that internally, we all have things to work on. We have our personality. We have character traits. We have you know, temptations, desires. There's a lot of stuff to work on. And that constitutes the internal work of transforming the land of Canaan, an unholy space, to the land of Israel, a holy space. And again, it's not a one-time deal. It's a work in progress. But the idea, this, the, the, the biblical command to conquer Canaan and transform it into Israel, that's not an ancient commandment. That's spiritually, Kabbalistically speaking, that's an ongoing internal dynamic of working on our own self. So Wait, say it again, say it again. Oh, in Israel. No, no, no. This is... Uh... Oh, oh, so we're stripping, we're stripping the the story and this mitzvah from its literal context. So literally, the context is about going into a physical space and transforming it from Canaan and making it a Jewish land. That's the physical, but we're stripping it from the physical construct and making it timeless and spiritual. So we're taking it out of time and space and making it timeless and spaceless, whatever. And not it's it's not going to be location based or time or era based. This is now a constant mitzvah. It's now a, it's, an, it's now an ongoing eternal call for each one of us, which is work on your internal landscape to transform it into a holy space. Um, okay, now let's continue. Page 26, second paragraph. This is where it gets very interesting. Now, the difference between Jericho and the rest of the land as they are represented in the soul of man is as follows. So he's about to contrast the difference between the entirety of the land and Jericho. And the reason, of course, why we're contrasting these two spaces is because the, the spies of Moses went to the whole land, whereas the spies of Joshua only went to Jericho. So what's the difference? Jericho represents the soul's three garments, thought, speech, and deed. The connection between Jericho and garments is as follows. Jericho, Yericho, connotes reach. Yericho is reach sent. And the garments relate to scent, as alluded to in the expression of the Zohar, in the scent of your garments. By the way, there's a lot of Kabbalah here, so I, I need to slow it down and explain it, which I will. So the first thing we need to know is about the composition of the soul. I mentioned before, and we've discussed many times, the soul is comprised of 10 soul powers, three intellectual and seven emotional. That is the landscape of the soul. However, in addition to the powers or these um, attributes of the soul, the soul also possesses three garments. The difference between the soul powers and the soul garments are as follows. It's like the difference between you and your clothing. What's the difference? You are you. Your clothing is just what you dress up in. Does that make sense? Yes? You are you. Your clothing is your clothing. What's, what, is in, what is interesting about clothing? Number one, it's not you, it's clothing. Number two, clothing can be, you can switch out your clothing. You can change one garment to another garment. It also characterizes, yes, and it expresses you. <laughs> Perfect. So when it comes to the soul, it's the same thing. There's who you are or who the soul is. The soul has the 10 powers the soul has 10 powers. That's who the soul is. Then there's how the soul expresses itself. And that is through the garments of the soul. What are the garments? The garments are not the soul. The garments are the, the vehicles for soul expression. It's like, huh? 
Packaging. The packaging. Oh, oh, it's the packaging. You have pro oh, good. You have product and packaging. The product is the soul. And the packaging, that's the expression. Now, here's how, how this works. Think about the three garments of the soul. Thought, speech, and action, or thought, speech, and deed. Let's start from the bottom up, action. You feel, so there's how you feel, that's how your soul feels, and then there's what you do, that's your garment, or the garment of the soul. So your soul can feel excited to express chesed, because that's one of the 10 powers of the soul, chesed, kindness. So now you want to, so you're going to volunteer. You want to, you feel, you want to be kind today. You want to volunteer. You want to help people um, have a hot meal. So you're going to volunteer in a soup kitchen or to distribute meals. Kesa, good. So that's how you feel inside. Then you actually do it. That's the garment that you put on. So there's how you feel, but then there's what you do. There's the product and the packaging. There's how you feel inside, and then there's what you do. There's also how you feel and what you say. Let's talk about speech for a second. You can feel kind and speak kind and loving words. You can feel angry and speak not so kind, loving words, right? So that's how that's how speech operates. Thought is also in a similar similar way as well. What's with thought? Thought is your own conscious expression of self to self. Thought is how you interface internally, how you express yourself internally. Thought is a constant running narrative of ideas, feelings, thoughts, et cetera, thought, literally thought, that is going on in your own head that you are privy to. Thought constitutes a garment of the soul. It's a vehicle of expression to self. So thought is expression of the soul to self in your own head. Speech is expression of yourself to others verbally, and action is expression of yourself in the physical world. Thought, speech, and action. And re remember what we said about, about garments before. The reason why they're called levushim, garments, is very, very intentional. A garment is not the, the person, is not the body. It's a separate, it's something separate. Garments can also be switched out. You can change your garments. What does that mean? You can change your thoughts. You can change your words. You can change your actions. Can you change yourself? A little harder. It's a little harder. That requires some cosmetic surgery. I'm kidding. That requires some, 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 deep, some deeper work. But you know what's a little easier? To change your thought, speech, and act. To change the garments is always easier than changing your actual self. So here's how this works. So imagine you are feeling not so happy. You're feeling you're a little bit upset or whatever it is, but you decide that despite how you feel, you're still going to volunteer at that soup kitchen and give out meals. That's a way in which you've now changed out your garments from being a direct expression of self to being something that expresses an aspiration that you might have, but not how you're actually feeling in that moment, which means that you can do something in defiance of how you feel. Does that make sense? Let's talk about speech even better. You can feel like you might want to say something negative and say something positive despite how you feel. You can be um, concerned or thinking about yourself and say something compassionate to someone else. You can speak in defiance of yourself. You know why? Because it's a garment. And because it's a garment, you can swap it out. You can switch it out. So action, you can switch out. Speech, you can switch out. Thought, you can also switch out. Now, I know what you're thinking. Thought. I know what you're thinking. Can I really switch out my thoughts? That's very internal. Kabbalah teaches that we can. It's like, it's all about what, yeah. That's harder. So Aaron helps you do it. Yes, and we'll talk about that. It can help from the outside in. Exactly. We typically think I need to change from the inside out. That's actually one of the big messages of this text is don't necessarily jump 
all the way in. You know who tried to jump all the way in? Moses. As we'll see, that was the spies that Moses sent. Those blew up. Joshua spies just went to Yericho, to Jericho. That's the garments. That's much more sustainable. It's much more attainable. In other words, when you think about personal change, I want to be a kinder person. There's two ways to do that. Either you work on yourself on the inside for decades to try to become a kind, or you just force yourself to, to act kinder. Which is more immediate? The latter. It change, in other words, which is easier? To change your garments or to change yourself? Change your garments is always going to be easier. And that doesn't make it less valuable just because it's easier. It's easier, and as, we'll, as you alluded to, it's actually on one level extremely valuable in creating that change that you wanted. Kind of fake it till you make it, right? It's like change from the outside in, as we'll see. But when it comes to thought, just to focus on thought for a quick second, sometimes we think, I can't change what I think. That's, that's who I am. Kabbalah says you can change what you think. This is where mind consciousness, uh, mindful consciousness comes in. Um, you know, we have been, for whatever reason, I think we've been trained to believe that our thoughts are just... Um, like they're just responses, like they're just they're passive and we have no control over that. Judaism, Kabbalah, empowers us to take control over our thought and to recognize that it is within our control. Our thought is also in our control. The best way that I can describe the difference between the difference between how we feel inside or, or what we the ideas that we have inside versus our conscious thought is like... Um, you know, the old school browsers. Remember those old school browsers like in the 90s? This is before ad blockers. And if you don't have an ad, I will recommend getting an ad blocker. Before ad blockers, when you would browse the world wide web, mm -hmm. right? You would get pop-ups. Again, you could still get pop-ups if uh, you know the right browser and the right uh, extensions, you can avoid that. But anyway, you, you would get pop-ups. And the pop-up would say, oh, click here for all sorts of Michigan. And we'll just keep it, We'll keep it family friendly, right? All sorts of, of craziness. And at that point, you have a choice. Whether you click on it, right? To, to explore more, or whether you find the little, the little X in the corner and, and shut it down, right? And shut it down. Close the window. The same thing is true in our mind, right? The same thing is true to a large extent in our mind, where we have ideas and feelings that come to us that kind of pop up in our in our in our thoughts. We have the choice whether to keep focusing on that or to shut it down. Now, if any as as if you've ever had experience with this to try to get out of a, a of a negative thought pattern. By the way, negative thought pattern. There's no no one no one will tell you what a negative thought pattern is. Only you know what that is for yourself. Whether that's a a sad or depressing thought or a dangerous thought or an unhealthy thought or a lustful thought, whatever that is, however you define that. But if you want to get yourself out of that, you know that to try to say, I don't want to think about that is never going to work. Right? It's like, I don't want to think about a, a, the white elephant. Like, uh, right? The more you think about not thinking about it, the more you think about it. So how do you get out of that thought? There's only one way. By redirecting your thought to another place. In other words, you're not going to stop thought. What you can do is redirect it to a different direction. That requires what we call hit bonenut or meditation. Meditation is a process. Sorry. I don't know. What, what I'm saying is that that if we if we consciously practice thinking about what we want to think about, then when those thoughts come to our head, whatever those self defeating thoughts, sad thoughts, whatever the the, the negative, whatever we've turned as negative for ourselves. Whatever is a negative thought for, 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 for me, if I've trained my mind to have the ability, like it's a muscle, if I've trained my, trained my mind that at in a moment, I can, th I can think about something and focus on that thing because you can only think about one thing at a time. So if I've trained my mind that I can, that I can choose what to think about and focus on the thing, and I've, and I've done that consciously, I've taken like 30 seconds or 60 seconds or, or two minutes or five minutes to just think about th the thoughts of my own choosing, then when I feel that, bubbling up to the surface, and I feel that negative thought, I can redirect my thoughts to where I want to be at and be in a, in, a, in a happier space, in a healthier space internally 
using the power of my mind, as opposed to what I think is the way we've been, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but like the way we've been trained almost over the last several decades is that our thoughts are the product of whatever someone else is trying to feed us, right? Turn on the TV. I don't think anybody turns on the TV like that anymore, but conceptually turn on the TV, right? And someone else is going to tell me what to look at, what to think about. Think about today with social media, scroll through feeds, TikTok, re- whatever it is. Like yeah, Now you have uh, reels and someone else is going to entertain you or tell you what to think about or tell you what's important. And, 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 and the, the mind being trained to be passive is very dangerous. To train the mind to be a passive, uh, uh, to be reactive instead of proactive does us a major disservice. Because what that means is that when something, uh, when a negative stimuli comes in front of us, whatever that negative is, I'll let you define it, when a negative, and, and then we start thinking and responding to that negativity, and we can't get ourselves out of it, because we haven't trained ourselves um, to be proactive about, no, that's, I don't want to think about that. I want to think about what I want to think about. I want to feel how I want to feel. I don't want to think about, I don't, I, I don't want to be a victim to what someone else is feeding me. I want to think about what I want to think about. And that's, that's profoundly uh, um, healthy. And that's what it means that thought is a garment. Because although you can't take it off, most garments you can take off, thought you can't take, you can't not think. You cannot speak. You cannot do. Thought, speech, and action are all garments. When it comes to speech and action, you can take off those clothes and not wear anything. You can, I want to say, I want to speak Lush and Hara. I want to speak negative about something. I can, close my mouth, walk away, take off that garment and not say anything. I want to do something. I want to take revenge. I don't have to. I can take off that garment and not do anything. I can also put on a garment of kindness. I can put on a car- garment of a, of a nice word. But when it comes to thought, I can't take off that garment. I can't take off my thought. I'm always going to be thinking. I can't stop thinking. The best I can do is switch out the garment. Change the garment. Yeah. My thoughts are right. I think that that is a powerful transformation that is happening. And I don't know, it would be a good, I think that the question would be, where is that transformation happening? Is it happening internal or just in the garment? Because that sounds like it's even going a little bit deeper. That sounds like a little bit of a, a more deeper work, which is great. Um, yeah, to replace judgment with compassion is fabulous. I once heard a rabbi, uh, Rabbi Label Wolf from Australia. He's a mystic. We're actually going to bring him here um, in a few months to speak um, right after the holidays. So I once heard him say the following. When someone shouts at you and you have the desire to shout back, think about this. Imagine somebody hurt their arm in an accident and is bleeding on the ground and is shouting and screaming in pain. You're going to scream at them? You're going to shout at them? You're going to criticize them? Of course not. You feel compassion. You feel like you have to help. And yet, when someone's crying out from emotional pain, why do we? Why do we want to strike at them? Why do we want to um, uh, uh, shout back? At them? Why don't we have the same compassion? So I think that meditation is fantastic. And that's a, that's a radical change. To, to change it from, from, wow, that person really did something foolish, and I'm going to judge them negatively, to compassion or love or forgiveness or whatever, that's very powerful. I would say that you're, you're now touching on a different mindset. This is even even uh, even more surface. That right now we're talking about something even more surface. More surface would be like, man, I, I really want to say something nasty. I'm just going to walk away. I'm not even getting into the whole psychology of judging them differently or retraining my thought to look at it positively. I'm just in the moment. I'm just going to walk away. That's like taking off that garment. I have a negative garment ready to go. Nope. Or I'm just going to say something nice because I'm. Uh, that's it. Or I'm going to think of something positive. It, that's about just transforming it in the moment. And by the way, where we're going to get to in this is 
And one of the big ideas of this discourse is that's what actually makes the most difference in this world is about how we show up in our garment state. Because how we feel inside is less important than what we say or do. Because the other person doesn't know how you feel. The person that you've just given, that you've just helped give a, a warm meal to, doesn't know that internally there was a whole battle going on about whether or not you wanted to show up and volunteer today. All they know is that they're getting a hot meal. That, and, that's, and that's really what matters. So what matters most is not how we feel inside, but it's about how we show up on the garment level on the outside. That makes the most actual impact in this world. What we do and what we say, and again, how we think is how we show up inside and how our own disposition is. But I think that's very important. Adam, do you have something? Of meditation? Oh, so good. And, and we'll end with this and then I'll close it out and, and we're going to set this up for next week. So meditation is, and that's an excellent question. Um, the way I would define it um, based on Kabbalah is as follows. It's not about clearing the mind. It's not about like emptying the mind. That's more Eastern meditation. Jewish meditation is about training myself to be able to hold an idea of my choosing in my mind for a certain amount of time without distraction. And that's going to happen slowly. And maybe at, at the beginning, I'll only be able to do that for 10 seconds before I get distracted, especially if I'm trying to not be distracted, then I'm self-distracting. Yeah. So it's much more innately than when I try to practice it for a certain way. And so I, it feels very, I don't know, it's like an like uncomfortable visceral feeling that's the effect. So it's interesting in the Hebrew, it's called hit boninut, which is from the word bina, which means to understand. It's not about clearing the mind. On the contrary, it's about focusing. It's about connecting with something. So it would be about, let's say, studying something. Let's say studying a piece of you know Jewish spiritual ideas, and then you and then you take some time, and and you and you try to think about it for ten seconds, and then you increase it for 15 seconds and then 30 seconds and then 60 seconds and train yourself to think about something positive. If you want to take it away from spiritual stuff, think about it, a, a, a positive experience, a positive experience that you had in your life, a vacation, a friendship, something positive that you can think about and, and it elicits a good feeling. And think about that and try to think about that without distraction. By the way, we do meditation all the time when we're driving down the highway and we're thinking about, I've said this before, and we're thinking about what somebody did to us two weeks ago and what they said and we start getting angry in the moment. It's like, I can't believe they said that. And you become angry. You're dry. They're not around, but you're in your own head and you build up this, uh, this anger. Guess what? You just practice meditation. Negative meditation, but meditation. Look at the Med trees around you instead. Yeah. And the idea here is though, but to get back to this point is about being practicing the ability to hold a thought in our minds, to be proactive about our thoughts. And, and why is that so important? Because when the neg when we find ourselves getting that negative thought, when that starts seeping in and it starts pulling us in, if we have built up that strength, we can easily, not with force, but just say, okay, actually, how about this other thought that I have? Yeah, it's a redirection of thought. It's nice and seamless and easy. And I'm not trying to make this sound like, I'm not trying to oversimplify this, but that would be the process process would be to kind of ease our way into a brand new uh, a brand new thought we can't stop thinking and we're not trying to, to fight it the rebel would speak often about this the Lubavitch Rebbe got uh, he got more mail than the president of the United States okay. he got the Rebbe got more mail physical mail than the president of the United States and so most of the questions were about health money Children, I mean, think about it, right? What, what were the questions? Rarely did somebody say, Rebbe, I mean, unfortunately, how, how can I daven better? It, it, it happened, but most of the questions were about, I'm struggling with something, can you help me? With, with like, uh, a lot of the questions were about internal, what we would call mental or emotional health. Like very, like stuff that we're, that everyone's talking about today, the Rebbe got thousands and thousands of letters and a lot of them are published. Of course, the details, the the personal details, are all taken out, and and you know it's it's it's. Uh, but you just have the 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 the, the Rebbe's response in general, and so often the Rebbe used the phrase called hesach hadas or hesach hadat. That means 
just redirect your mind away from that. Someone's struggling and they're battling and what about this, that, or the other? The Rebbe say, Hesachadas, which literally means don't think about it, but it's much more profound than don't think about it. You can't tell someone don't think about it. Then they're going to think about it. It's not don't think about it. It's redirect your thoughts into a to another space. Don't even beat yourself up about the negativity because then you're still stuck in it. You know, tshuva really means not to like beat yourself up over it because then you're just voyeuristically replaying it in your head. That's the Yet Sahara saying, how can we do this again? Right? It's like, I feel bad about it. Guess what? You're excited. You're super excited about feeling bad about it. You love feeling bad. Not you. I'm saying one. One loves feeling bad about it. You know why? You get to replay it. And feel righteous about it. Oh, win, win. I get to replay it and feel righteous, self-righteous about it. It's fantastic. Win, win. You know what tshuva really is? Moving on. Just pivot, pivoting. Pivoting. Repents, returning, but pivoting. Pivoting. Yes, back to who you are. But the point is pivoting back. So to close out today's conversation, we kind of got back into the to the spy stuff. We contrasted the story of Moses. Is that a chuppah going up? Yeah. Oh, really sweet. Oh, wow. That's a, someone's getting married. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or... No, that's a Russian couple getting married. Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, wow. That's, that's, so, that's so nice. So, in short, we'll summarize and then we'll, uh, and then we'll dance. I'm kidding. I don't know what the wedding is. <laughs> so, uh, just in summary... So we started, we jumped into our text, which is monumental because we've had like three sessions outside setting this up. We jumped into our text. And what we saw is we have two stories, one spy failure, one spy success. One is coming from God. One is not coming from God. One is going to the whole land. One is going to only Jericho, Yericho. And we're trying to understand what this means for us in 2023, who we are, where we're at. And we said like this, I'm just giving a quick summary. We said that going into Israel, conquering Israel, or transforming into Israel, that's not an ancient uh, geographical or geopolitical conversation. That is you and I becoming better people internally. There's two ways to do that. You can either do the deep dive inside and try to transform your character, or you can work on your garments. You don't have to choose. But I'm saying you could. You could either do some serious internal work or try to do that let me i'm that, that you know what that would look like they would look like i want to i don't want to become triggered by my triggers anymore or i no longer want to want what i want let me know how that works out for you that may that may take a while i no longer want to want what i want but how about i'll no longer do or allow that to take over my thought, speech, and action. That's a little bit more attainable. And that's where we're going with this, that there's two areas, two arenas. Not, not, it's not either or, but there are two arenas of work that we can do. There's the internal, internal work, and then there is the garment work. The garment work is going to be, as we'll see, is going to be a little bit easier, a little bit more. Yes. And as we'll see, it's going to, oh, what, cognitive behavioral therapy. There we go. Is that nice. why the International Ladies Garment Workers Union was formed? <laughs> that's why you didn't. That's why Jews have been in the shmata business, that's right? It's thought. all about the garments. That's how it's looking your book. I can make the patterns. Garments of the soul. Yeah, look at this. I remember. I I actually worked for the publisher. I I worked on this design. I didn't design it myself. Eh, we could have done better. But anyway, <laughs> bottom line is, uh, this week here's the homework for this week. I mean, we're just getting into this conversation. We're going to develop this over the next few weeks. But just, just uh, I, I think to focus on this week. What, at one moment this week, try to catch yourself, either in thought, speech, or action, um, thinking about something perhaps that you'd rather not think about or say about to say something that you'd rather not say or that you know you shouldn't say or do something that you shouldn't do. Try to catch yourself in that moment and remind yourself, wait, this is a garment that I have control over. I'm not, we're not talking about radical transformation of identity and self. That's, that's going to be a longer uh, avodah. That's going to be a longer work. But can I, in this moment, change my garment of action? Can I change my garment of speech? Can I even redirect my garment of thought? And knowing that I can, let's do that this week and see how that feels. You know, when you were talking about all this, 
right now in contemporary secular self-help stuff, it's all about basically changing the guard. Yeah, somebody wrote here in the chat, cognitive behavioral therapy, which I don't know exactly the clinical term. It just, um, you recognize your thought and you don't just blow it away. You recognize it and then you redirect your thought. Something there you go. So it's Modern like, psychology is catching up to Kabbalah. That that always so the truth, you know, King David says in, in Psalms, Eret, emet mi eret titzmach, the truth grows from the ground. You know what that means? That whatever you try to bury, at some point it comes up. You can't bury things. So truth always comes up. Yeah, so it's not surprising. Yes, so it's not surprising. So this week, let's focus on the garments, redirecting thought or speech, or action, but knowing the empower, the, to me, the empowering thing is knowing that we have immediate control over those things. You don't have to do a deep dive, you know, it's not like a whole complicated thing. It's a, I'm not trying to downplay it either, but it's it's a it's a garment change. We all change our garments, right? We're all changing our clothing. Um, wardrobe change, so this is about the wardrobe change. Designer clothing? Huh? Is it designer clothing? <laughs> Spiritual designer clothing. Larry, you had a, you wanted to say something? No? I had a question. Next week. All right, next week. All right, so same bad time, same bad channel. Oh, very important. Next week, there's going, is there another wedding next week? Fourth of July. Oh, it is Fourth of July. Oh, yes. And there's also a wedding. So question, who was around Fourth of July weekend? Tentatively? Okay. I'm around. The problem is I'm not around the next two weeks after that. We'll be up in Boston. So. Boston? Boston. You drive and say you can park the car? No. Uh, we're fly I don't know how to say it. We're driving. Oh, so we're walking. So yeah. Me and the Jewish people, it's going to take 40 years. So um, <laughs> they should have gotten a GPS. They would have gotten there. Um, huh? I should have spent spies. No, I have spies. <laughs> Trust me. I have spies on the ground. I got all the scoop on the kosher restaurants there. I'm all set. But um, I will be gone. I mean, I'll be out of town. We, I guess we could do Zoom, but I don't know. But um, I'm out of town. You to take off a week. The, well, two it's weeks. Okay. The 9th and the 16th. So I'm therefore inclined not to do three weeks off, but to do something July. So I know it's the holiday weekend. I know not everyone can make it. We'll record it. It'll be on Zoom if you're not around here live and local. Hi, but Ed. I think... Oof. I'm not around. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be a hot breakfast next week. It's going to be continental. I love that term now. It's going to be continental. And uh, we're going to pick it up. So I think as of right now, uh, we're going to have class. Um, this There is a wedding. I, I thought there was only one next week, but I guess there's also this week. I don't know. I was told there's a wedding. So this room, I think, no, no, I'm saying next week. Clearly this week oh, also. They're, using this and they're going to use this for the Badekin. Uh, so we're going to be in that room, in the daily show. So we'll be in there. Put the Badekin. I don't, I, um, I don't run this. <laughs> I don't run logistics. So next week we'll be there. We'll also again be live on Zoom. We'll have breakfast. Join us holiday weekend for some fireworks, Kabbalah, Kabbalah with fireworks, explosive Kabbalah, something like that. Bring your sparklers. Don't bring your sparklers. It's all going to be great. All right. Shavuot Tov, everyone. Remember, your garments are in your control. Godspeed. All right. See y'all. Take care. Right now, Bye, guys. The sitting of the dry cleaners. <laughs>